Popper didn't use falsification as the one and only way to tell science from pseudoscience. So that's just, that's just rubbish. How do you determine if a, if a theory like string theory or the multiverse, et cetera, paradigms, if they, you know, if, as it's often stated, not directly by you, I don't think, but that it can't be falsified. So let's not, let's not, I mean, it's often used as a way to dismiss something by a critics of string theory. Oh, it can't be tested. It can't be falsified. So therefore it's not science as if Popper is the ultimate arbiter of what's right and wrong. The way that Girdle is the arbiter of what can be provable or not within the context of mathematics. Does that make sense? Popper, reliance yeah, yes, on Popper. But, well, but there, there are many things to, to be said about this. Uh, one thing is that Popper didn't use falsification as the one and only way to tell uh, science from pseudoscience. So that's just, that's just rubbish. Uh, and uh, actually, I think that this is um, part of the problem that you see in high energy um, phenomenology and in other um, related areas is that they tend to think that just because they are able to make a potentially falsifiable prediction it's science which mm. is nonsense of course um, mm -hmm. and uh, they use this to excuse a lot of uh, mathematics basically uh, and uh, hide all their guesswork in some kind of equation. But that's in the end, that's exactly what it is. It's some guesswork. Mm. And so you were talking about this um, diphoton anomaly um, that disappeared. So I tell this story in my book where they had these 600 papers that were published uh, within a matter of a month. And this highlights exactly this problem. Uh, they believe that this is good science largely because, um, you know, they, they are make, making some kind of prediction, basically. So maybe that's not the best example now that I think about it, because it wasn't even a prediction, it was a post-diction. It's a retrodiction. Right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Post so not even that in, in this case. Um, but... Um, you know, if you, if you look at the phenomenological models that people are using, like for supersymmetry, you know, you have all these uh, uh, supersymmetric, um, these variations of supersymmetry that uh, supposedly tell you what's the mass of this or that particle, or all the dark matter uh, models uh, and so on. That's all supposedly science because they make some kind of prediction. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is just wrong. Um, and this, of course, also means that uh, you can't just go and um, dismiss string theory because it's supposedly um, non-falsifiable. So I, I should add here that this isn't even true. Uh, string theory is, in principle, falsifiable. Um, I mean, it, it predicts that uh, the world's made of strings. I mean, that's a, <laughs> that's a prediction. <laughs> the problem is that it's it's unfalsifiable in practice. You know, no no one no one's going to see these things. Uh, in the next 1,000 years or something. Um, so really, that's that's not the problem uh, with, um, with with string theory or multiverses uh, and so on. Mm. But really, the problem is that um, th these theories are just unnecessary to begin with. They don't actually solve any problem. They don't constitute any kind of progress. Um, mm -hmm. And so this brings up the question again, like, uh, then why do theorists work on this stuff nevertheless? Right. And that's because they think it's prettier. Like, so you, you put up this uh, image about supersymmetry. Um, yeah, yeah, I know. You can ask, well, why do they believe in that? Mm -hmm. Well, because they think it would be pretty if there was some kind of uh, symmetry relating the fermions and the bosons. <laughs> yeah, and, and there are symmetries that relate, you know, octets and I mean, there, symmetry has played a huge role in the uh, construction of what's known as a standard model. So it, it's not without justification that, I mean, it shouldn't be your starting point. And, and I guess your point is that too many people say, well, let's look for something that's incredibly beautiful. Uh, but that might be just a mental shortcut, a hack, you know, to get to the answer faster, perhaps. Um, well, you, sh you shouldn't lose the problem that you're trying to solve out of sight. So um, you're right, of course. Symmetries have been very useful uh, in physics. So uh, it, it made sense after the standard model was largely completed um, to try to increase the symmetry and see if that works. Mm. And that's exactly what people did in the 1980s. Uh, but the thing is, it did not work. 
Yeah. You know, they, they, they tried these grand unified theories one after the other, and they were ruled out one after the other. They've been looking for supersymmetry uh, also since the 1980s, uh, and basically was ruled out in the 1990s. Uh, it's just that they didn't give up on it. Uh, instead, they, you know, fixed the theory, so it was still... Um, in agreement with data and then it was supposed to be found at the Tevatron and at, at LAP and then it was to be found at the LHC and each time this didn't happen they came up with some excuse and and so, so that really is the problem that they are not learning from their mistakes and, and mm. that's really you know the most important thing in science is that you learn uh, from the data you get and exactly that's not happening and that's really the problem.